the Second French Empire was the imperial Bonapartist regime of Napoleon III from 1852 to 1870, between the Second Republic and the Third Republic, in France. Rule of Napoleon III The structure of the French government during the Second Empire was little changed from the first. But Emperor Napoleon III stressed his own imperial role as the foundation of the government. If government was to guide of the people toward domestic justice and external peace, it was his role as emperor, holding his power by universal male suffrage and representing all of the people, to function as supreme leader and safeguard the achievements of the revolution. He had so often, while in prison or in exile, chastised previous oligarchical governments for neglecting social questions that it was imperative France now prioritize their solutions. His answer was to organize a system of government based on the principles of the Napoleonic idea. This meant that the emperor, the elect of the people as the representative of the democracy, ruled supreme. He himself drew power and legitimacy from his role as representative of the great Napoleon I of France, who had sprung armed from the French Revolution like Minerva from the head of Jove. The anti-parliamentary French constitution of 1852 instituted by Napoleon III on January 14, 1852, was largely a repetition of that of 1848. All executive power was entrusted to the emperor, who, as head of state, was solely responsible to the people. The people of the empire, lacking democratic rights, were to rely on the benevolence of the emperor rather than on the benevolence of politicians. He was to nominate the members of the Council of State, whose duty it was to prepare the laws, and of the Senate, a body permanently established as a constituent part of the empire. One innovation was made, namely, that the legislative body was elected by universal suffrage, but it had no right of initiative, all laws being proposed by the executive power. This new political change was rapidly followed by the same consequences had attended that of Brumaire. On December 2, 1852, France, still under the effect of Napoleon's legacy, and the fear of anarchy, conferred almost unanimously by a plebiscite the supreme power, with the title of emperor, upon Napoleon III. The legislative body was not allowed to elect its own president or to regulate its own procedure, or to propose a law or an amendment, or to vote on the budgets in detail, or to make its deliberations public. Similarly, Universal suffrage was supervised and controlled by means of official candidature, by forbidding free speech and action in electoral matters to the opposition, and by a gerrymandering in such a way as to overwhelm the liberal vote in the mass of the rural population. The press was subjected to a system of cautionments and advertisements, under sanction of suspension or suppression. Books were subject to censorship. In order to counteract the opposition of individuals, a surveillance of suspects was instituted. Falais or Cena's attack on the emperor in 1858, though purely Italian in its motive, served as a pretext for increasing the severity of this rare copyright gime by the law of general security which authorized the internment, exile or deportation of any suspect without trial. In the same way public instruction was strictly supervised, the teaching of philosophy was suppressed and the liquor copywriters, and the disciplinary powers of the administration were increased. For seven years France had no democratic life. The empire governed by a series of plebiscites. Up to 1857 the opposition did not exist. From then till 1868 it was reduced to five members, Daraman, a Permel Mile Olivier, Ha Copyright Non, Jules Favre and Ernest Picard. The royalists waited inactive after the new and unsuccessful attempt made at Fruchtorf in 1853, by a combination of the legitimists and all the copyright anists, to recreate a living monarchy out of the ruin of two royal families. History. Equals coup of 1851 equals. On December 2, 1851 Louis Napoli copyright on Bonaparte, who had been elected president of the republic, staged a coup d'état copyright tat by dissolving the National Assembly without having the constitutional right to do so. He thus became sole ruler of France, and re-established universal suffrage, previously abolished by the Assembly. His decisions and the extension of his mandate for ten years were popularly endorsed by a referendum later that month that attracted an implausible 92% support. 
a new constitution was enacted in January 1852 which made Louis Napoleon copyright on president for ten years and concentrated virtually all governing power in his hands. However, he was not content with merely being an authoritarian president. Almost as soon as he signed the new document into law, he set about restoring the empire. In response to officially inspired requests for the return of the empire, the Senate scheduled a second referendum in November, which passed with 97% support. As with the December 1851 referendum, most of the yes votes were manufactured out of thin air. The empire was formally re-established on December 2, 1852, and the prince president became Napoli copyright on 3, Emperor of the French. The constitution concentrated so much power in his hands that the only substantive changes were to replace the word president with the word emperor, and to make the post hereditary. The popular referendum became a distinct sign of Bonapartism, which Charles de Gaulle would later use. Equals early reign equals. Napoleon III's joy was at its height in 1856, as the Crimean War resulted in a peace which excluded Russia from the Black Sea, and when his son Eugenie Bonaparte was born, which promised a continuation of his dynasty. In 1859, Napoleon led France to war with Austria over Italy. France was victorious, and gained Savoy and Nice, but the idea of Italian unification, based as it was on the exclusion of the temporal power of the popes, outraged French Catholics, who had been the leading supporters of the empire. A keen Catholic opposition sprang up, voiced in Louis Voulot's paper The Univers, and was not silenced even by the Syrian expedition in favor of the Catholic Maronite side of the Trazia Euro Maronite conflict. On the other hand, the commercial treaty with the United Kingdom, which was signed in January 1860, and which ratified the free trade policy of Richard Cobden and Michel Chevalier, had brought upon French industry the sudden shock of foreign competition. Thus both Catholics and protectionists discovered that authoritarian rule can be an excellent thing when it serves their ambitions or interests, but a bad one when exercised at their expense. But Napoleon, in order to restore the prestige of the empire before the newly awakened hostility of public opinion, tried to gain from the left the support which he had lost from the right. After the return from Italy the general amnesty of August 16, 1859 had marked the evolution of the absolutist or authoritarian empire towards the liberal, and later parliamentary empire, which was to last for ten years. Freedom of the press, Napoleon began by removing the gag which was keeping the country in silence. On November 24, 1860, he granted to the chambers the right to vote and address annually in answer to the speech from the throne and to the press the right of reporting parliamentary debates. He counted on the latter concession to hold in check the growing Catholic opposition, which was becoming more and more alarmed by the policy of laissez-faire practiced by the emperor in Italy. The government majority already showed some signs of independence. The right of voting on the budget by sections, granted by the emperor in 1861, was a new weapon given to his adversaries. Everything conspired in their favor the anxiety of those candid friends who were calling attention to the defective budget. The commercial crisis, aggravated by the American Civil War. And above all, the restless spirit of the emperor, who had annoyed his opponents in 1860 by insisting on an alliance with the United Kingdom in order to forcibly open the Chinese ports for trade, in 1863 by his ill-fated attempt of a military intervention in Mexico to set up a Latin empire in favor of the Archduke Maximilian of Austria, and from 1861 to 1863 by embarking on colonizing experiments in Cochinchina and Annam. Similar inconsistencies occurred in the emperor's European policies. The support which he had given to the Italian cause had aroused the eager hopes of other nations. The proclamation of the Kingdom of Italy on February 18, 1861 after the rapid annexation of Tuscany and the Kingdom of Naples had proved the danger of half-measures. But when a concession, however narrow, had been made to the liberty of one nation, it could hardly be refused to the no less legitimate aspirations of the rest. In 1863 these new rights again clamoured loudly for recognition, in Poland, in Schleswig and Holstein, in Italy, now indeed united, but with neither frontiers nor capital, and in the Danubian principalities. In order to extricate himself from the Polish impasse, 
the emperor again had recourse to his expedient a euro always fruitless because always inopportune a euro of a congress. He was again unsuccessful, Great Britain refused even to admit the principle of a congress, while Austria, Prussia and Russia gave their adhesion only on conditions which rendered it futile, that is they reserved the vital questions of Venetia and Poland. The Union Liebe copyright rail, thus Napoleon had to yet again disappoint the hopes of Italy, let Poland be crushed, and allow Prussia to triumph over Denmark in the Schleswig-Holstein question. These inconsistencies resulted in a combination of the opposition parties, legitimist, liberal and republican, in the Union Liebe copyright rail. The elections of Mayer Euro June 1863 gained the opposition 40 seats and a leader, Adolf Thiers, who at once urgently gave voice to its demand for the necessary liberties. It would have been difficult for the emperor to mistake the importance of this manifestation of French opinion, and in view of his international failures, impossible to repress it. The sacrifice of Persian Minister of the Interior, who was responsible for the elections, the substitution for the ministers without portfolio of a sort of presidency of the council filled by Hugo Nirua, the vice-emperor, and the nomination of Jean-Victor de Rally, an anti-clerical, as Minister of Public Construction, in reply to those attacks of the Church which were to culminate in the syllabus of 1864, all indicated a distinct rapprochement between the Emperor and the Left. But though the opposition represented by Viers was rather constitutional than dynastic, there was another and irreconcilable opposition, that of the amnestied or voluntarily exiled Republicans, of whom Victor Hugo was the eloquent mouthpiece. Thus those who had formerly constituted the governing classes were again showing signs of their ambition to govern. There appeared to be some risk that this movement among the bourgeoisie might spread to the people. As Antarius recruited his strength by touching the earth, so Napoleon believed that he would consolidate his menaced power by again turning to the laboring masses, by whom that power had been established. Assured of support, the emperor, through Rua, a supporter of the absolutist Ra copyright chime, refused all fresh claims on the part of the liberals. He was aided by the cessation of the industrial crisis as the American Civil War came to an end, by the apparent closing of the Roman question by the Convention of September 15, which guaranteed to the Papal States the protection of Italy, and finally by the Treaty of October 30, 1864, which temporarily put an end to the crisis of the Schleswig-Holstein question. Rise of Prussia, things went badly, however, when Prussia defeated Austria in the Austro-Prussian War of 1866 and emerged as the dominant power in Germany. Confidence in the excellence of imperial raw copyright jime vanished. Thiers and Jules Favre, as representatives of the opposition, denounced the blunders of 1866. A permal mile Olivier split the official majority by the amendment of the 45 and made it understood that a reconciliation with the empire would be impossible until the emperor granted entire liberty. The recall of French troops from Rome, in accordance with the Convention of 1864, led to further attacks by the Ultramontane party, who were alarmed for the papacy. Napoleon III felt the necessity for developing the Great Act of 1860 by the decree January 19, 1867. In spite of Rua, by a secret agreement with Olivier, the right of interpolation was restored to the chambers. Reforms in press supervision and the right of holding meetings were promised. In vain did Rua try to meet the liberal opposition by organizing a party for the defense of the empire, the Union Dynastique. The rapid succession of international reverses prevented him from effecting anything. The emperor was abandoned by men and disappointed by events. He had hoped that, though by granting the freedom of the press and authorizing meetings, he had conceded the right of speech, he would retain the right of action. But he had played into the hands of his enemies. Victor Hugo's car sent Timons, Rochefort's lantern, the subscription for the monument to Bordin, the deputy killed at the barricades in 1851, followed by La Copyright on Gambetta's speech against the Empire on the occasion of the trial of de Lescluze, soon showed that the Republican Party was irreconcilable. Mobilization of the working classes, on the other hand, the Ultramontane party were becoming discontented, while the industries formerly protected were dissatisfied with free trade reform. The working classes had abandoned their political neutrality. 
disregarding Pierre Joseph Proudhon's impassioned attack on communism, they had gradually been won over by the collectivist theories of Karl Marx and the revolutionary theories of Mikhail Bakhnin, as set forth at the Congresses of the International. At these labor congresses, the fame of which was only increased by the fact that they were forbidden, it had been affirmed that the social emancipation of the worker was inseparable from his political emancipation. The union between the internationalists and the republican bourgeois became an accomplished fact. The empire, taken by surprise, sought to curb both the middle classes and the laboring classes, and forced them both into revolutionary actions. There were multiple strikes. The elections of May 1869, which took place during these disturbances, inflicted upon the empire a serious moral defeat. In spite of the revival by the government of the cry of the Red Terror, Olivier, the advocate of conciliation, was rejected by Paris, while 40 irreconcilables and 116 members of the Third Party were elected. Concessions had to be made to these. So by the Senatus Consult of September 8, 1869 a parliamentary monarchy was substituted for personal government. On January 2, 1870 Olivier was placed at the head of the first homogeneous, united and responsible ministry. Plebiscite of 1870, but the Republican Party, unlike the country, which hailed this reconciliation of liberty and order, refused to be content with the liberties they had won. They refused all compromise declaring themselves more than ever decided upon the overthrow of the empire. The killing of the journalist Victor Noir by Pierre Bonaparte, a member of the imperial family, gave the revolutionaries their long-desired opportunity. But the A-copyright mute ended in a failure. In a concession to democratic currents, the emperor put his policy to a plebiscite on May 8, 1870. The result was a substantial success for Bonaparte with seven and a half million in favor and only one and a half million against. However, the vote also signified divisions in France. Those affirming were found mainly in rural areas, while the opposition prevailed in the big towns. This success, which should have consolidated the empire, determined its downfall. It was thought that a diplomatic success would make the country forget liberty in favor of glory. It was in vain that after the parliamentary revolution of January 2, 1870, Comte d'Arles revived, through Lord Clarendon, Count Bust's plan of disarmament after the Battle of Car Paragraph Nigra Currency TZ. He met with a refusal from Prussia and from the imperial entourage. The Empress Yuga copyright Nye was credited with the remark, If there is no war, my son will never be emperor. And of the empire. The rise of neighboring Prussia during the 1860s caused a great deal of unease within the National Assembly of France, culminating in the July Crisis of 1870. On July 15, the government of a Pamel Mile Olivier declared war on Prussia, nominally over the Ohensevran candidature for the throne of Spain, the pretext for France to declare war in order to satisfy France's increasing unease and desire to halt Prussian expansion in Europe. During July and August 1870, the Imperial French Army suffered a series of defeats which culminated in the Battle of Sedan. At Sedan, the remnants of the French Field Army, and Napoleon III himself, surrendered to the Prussians on September 1. News of Sedan reached Paris on September 4. The National Assembly was invaded by a mob and during the afternoon of September 4, Parisian deputies formed a new government. At the Hartel de Ville. Republican deputy La Copyright on Gambetta declared the fall of the empire and the establishment of the Third Republic. Empress Yuga Copyright Nye fled the Tuileries for Great Britain, effectively ending the empire, which was officially declared defunct and replaced with the government of national defense. See also, Paris during the Second Empire, Claude-Henri de Rovroy, Comte de Saint-Simon, List of French Possessions and Colonies, Second Empire, French Colonial Empire. Sources, this article incorporates text from a publication now in the public domain, Chisholm, Hugh, ed. Encyclopaedia Britannica. Cambridge University Press. References, Wiriath, Paul. A Short History of France, Illustrated, pages 107. This was a favorite maxim of Napoleon III. March, Thomas. The History of the Paris Commune of 1871. London.
S. Soninen and Co., Ltd. New York, Macmillan and Co. Pages 8. Further reading. Equals surveys equals, and so, Eric, Napala copyright on 3, on St. Simon a Cheval, Paris, Talandia. Bagley, David. Napoleon III and his regime, an extravaganza excerpt and text search, Berry, J. Napoleon III and the Second Empire, Troisel, Francis La Duia Mira Copyright Publique La Second Empire au jour le jour, Chronology a Copyright Redite da Copyright a la Copyright e, CNRS Editions. Eschard, William E. Historical Dictionary of the French Second Empire, 1852-1870 Online, Macmillan, James. Napoleon III, Price, Roger. Napoleon III and the Second Empire, Plesius, Alain, and Jonathan Mandelbaum. The Rise and Fall of the Second Empire, 1852-1871 Excerpt and Text Search, Smith, WHC Second Empire and Commune, France 1848-7198 pp. Toulard, Jean, Dictionnaire du Second Empire, Paris, Fayard, 1348 p. Equals Politics Equals Berenson, E. Populist Religion and Left Wing Politics in France, 1830 a Euro 52, Batocci, P. Jules Simon, Republican Anti Clericalism and Cultural Politics in France, 1848 a Euro 86, Berry, J. Entombs, Arthias, 1797 a Euro 1877. A Political Life, Elwitt, S. The Making of the Third Republic. Class and Politics in France 1868 Euro 84, Payne, H. The Police State of Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, 1851 Euro 60, Price, Roger. The French Second Empire, An Anatomy of Political Power Online, Zeldin, Theodore. The Political System of Napoleon III. Equals Military and Diplomatic Equals, Adriance, T. The Last Gator Button. A Study of the Mobilization and Concentration of the French Army in the War of 1870, Anderson, Our Education in France, 1848-70, Euro 70, Case, Lynn M. French Opinion on War and Diplomacy During the Second Empire Online, Eschard, W. Napoleon III and the Concert of Europe, Holmes, R., The Road to Sedan, The French Army 1866-70, Euro 70, London 1984, Howard, Michael. The Franco-Prussian War. Equals Social and Economic Equals, Gibson, R.A. Social History of French Catholicism 1789 Euro 1914, Gildia, R. Education in Provincial France, 1800 Euro 1914, Pinckney, David, Napoleon III and the Rebuilding of Paris, Princeton 1958, Price, Roger. The French Second Republic. A Social History. Equals historiography equals Campbell S. The Second Empire Revisited: A Study in French Historiography. External links: The Civil War in France. Karl Marx's Third Address to the Paris Commune describes character of Second Empire.